I'm going to encourage you to draw your own pictures of levers. So this section of our notes, this would be musculoskeletal levers and how they operate. Musculo. Sometimes hard to write with a tablet. Sorry. Musculo skeletal levers. Musculoskeletal levers. And the first thing I want you to draw is one of these. They do have one of these in your textbook, but I want you to draw one of your own. You know this thing, playground toy. And I'll draw a couple of happy kids playing on it. All right, a couple of happy kids playing on this thing. What is this thing called? Teeter-totter, seesaw, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. doesn't really matter what you call it. What matters is it's a lever. In your notes, levers have three parts. A fulcrum will label F. That's one part. That's the turning point. That's the pivot of my lever. A lever also has two forces at play, which we always show with a little lowercase f so as not to be confused with uppercase f, that is the fulcrum. Look at this teeter-totter lever system. First question, where is the fulcrum? You can pause me while I figure it out. Where is the fulcrum? Right here in the center, this is the turning point. So I'm going to label it F for fulcrum. Where are the two forces? Well, the forces here are represented by my two kids. So I've got the force of kid number one right here. And I've got the force of kid number two over here. Voila, a lever. One fulcrum, two forces. That's all we need to actually qualify as a lever. Brought in some rather high-tech visual aid. You see this stick I often carry around with me when I'm going to lecture. If you're there in person, you've probably seen the stick that he's always carrying with him everywhere he goes. Well, it can make a lever because, look, it perfectly balanced, isn't it? Ooh, look at this. So, the fulcrum is right where my thumb is. Everybody see that? And the forces are the mass on either end of my stick, which is seesawing, teeter-tottering, right? Everybody see that? Now, if the two kids were of perfectly equal mass, the seesaw, the teeter-totter would be perfectly level, wouldn't it? If one of them had more mass or less mass, you know how it works. This is a lever. All it has to have is those three parts. One fulcrum and two forces at play. Now, let's do the hard part. And I want you to understand, this is the hard part. This is the difficult part. Once you get this, 
hopefully everything else will seem a little easier. So I want you to look at this picture of the seesaw, the teeter-totter, and I like to tell a tale of these two kids who are best friends. They get together every day after school, they go across the street to the park, and they play on the seesaw, the teeter-totter. Right? Everything's great. But, sad story, kid number two, mom got a new job on the other side of town, and kid number two moved away. Kid number one, now, very sad, goes outside every night, these are tears, sits on the seesaw and cries because his best friend moved away or her best friend moved away or their best friend moved away like that sad kid number one but kid number one has a parent and kid number one's parent looks out their parents in the room you know what i'm talking about you see your child out there crying every night because their best friend moved away you feel bad so Mom, dad, whoever goes out there to teeter-totter with their kid, but here's the problem. Mom or dad, they're an adult. They're bigger. So now I've got the force of parent over here, which is a much bigger force, isn't it? Greater mass, because we're talking about an adult. So here's my question. Here's the important thing. I want you to understand. If the parent, mom, dad, whoever, wanted to properly teeter-totter or seesaw with their kid, where must they sit? Because we know they can't sit out here because their force is too great and the kid's going to go flying off into the clouds, right? Where does the parent have to sit to teeter-totter with their kid? Tell me. Think about it. Well, definitely somewhere out here closer to the fulcrum, don't they? So let's draw the parent here again to finish out my story. So here's the parent. Remember, an adult right? Sorry, I can't draw good people. The parent, the force of the parent now is right here. X marks the spot. Not out here. And just to make you happy, now our kid's all happy because we can teeter-totter again and, you know, I can make a play date and see my friend on Saturday or whatever. So here's my point. This is the hard, this is literally the hard part. If the two forces in my lever system are not equal, where do you find the greatest force? What's its location? Is the greatest force the one closer to or farther away from the fulcrum? Well, let's look at the distances here. That's the length of the lever arm from fulcrum to parent. Here's the length of the lever arm from fulcrum to kid. The greatest force is the one found closest to the fulcrum. I'm going to repeat this and you should write it down somewhere if you haven't already done so. In a lever system, the greatest force is the one found closest to the fulcrum. I'll illustrate again. So, I'm going to now draw a person. I'm going to try to do my best here. Let's say I draw somebody so you can get oriented. There is their head. I hope you get that's a head, right? And here is their arm. 
So watch how I draw this because my picture's so bad, I'm going to have to label this for you a bunch of different ways, but I think you'll get what I'm going for here. This bone is the ulna. This bone is the humerus. Since I'm unable to properly draw hands, you've seen that already, I'm going to make this person holding a weight right here. This is their elbow. In case you can't tell because Dwayne's such a terrible artist. So what we have here is a person, let me demonstrate, exercising at the gym. So which way were they facing that way? Their arm is like this and they're doing a tricep extension. They're lifting a weight like this. Everybody see that? If, if this helps, right? So, so here's what they're doing. Working this tricep. So a tricep press, a tricep extension, a skull crusher for the gym rats. That's what we have a picture of right here. It's a musculoskeletal lever. The person in the picture is trying to move the weight that away using what muscle? The triceps brachii muscle, which is connected to the olecranon process of your ulna by a tendon right here. So where is the fulcrum? Right here in the synovial joint of the elbow, we always symbolize it with a capital F and a great big dot. That's the fulcrum. Where are the two forces? I have the force of the weight right here, whatever the weight is. And here's the second hard part, everybody. I have the force of the muscle, but where is that? Where is the force of the muscle? Right here. Right where the tendon is attached to and yanks on this bone. Because this tendon is going to pull on the bone that way to make the arm swing upward. Here's the mistake people often make. They think the force of the muscle is somewhere out here where the muscle is. No, forget about that. Totally wrong. Because where can a muscle exert force? Only at its insertion. If Wonder Woman has a lasso around you, what's the only place she can exert force on you? Where the lasso is connected to your body, right? This is the way it is with musculoskeletal levers. So the force exerted by the muscle only exists... Sorry, got a little mouse problem, which I get, only exists right where the muscle is inserted. I'm going to repeat this. Remember it. Only right here where the insertion is can the muscle pull on anything. Now do this just in your head. Look at how far away the weight is from the fulcrum as opposed to the muscle is from the fulcrum. And I just told you this, everybody. Where do I find the greatest force located? 
Where do I find the greatest force? Closest to the fulcrum. I'm going to repeat that. Where do I find the greatest force? Closest to the fulcrum. Which force is closer to the fulcrum? Muscle or weight in my picture? Muscle. So it's a greater force. So whatever the force of the weight is, the muscle must be greater. I'm just, I'm just making this up now. Let's say the force of the weight is 20 pounds. What's the force that I must pull here to move 20 pounds? Remember, this would be like the parent the weight would be like the kid. This muscle force is much greater than 20 pounds. There are actually physics formulas I can use to calculate this sort of thing. So remember, we're talking about, you know, somebody at the gym, they're doing that tricep extension, right? So let's say I have a weight that's 20 pounds. A 20 pound weight, everybody. I'm trying to do this. Let me center myself a little bit. With a 20 pound weight. The force created right here by my tricep brachii must be a lot more than the 20 pounds I'm trying to move. Let's say, maybe you can see tricep kickback, right? <clears throat> With a weight, <clears throat> like that. If the weight is 20 pounds, the force required to move it is much greater than 20 pounds. We can actually calculate this. In order to move a 20 pound weight, do not write this down, this is just an example. In order to move a 20 pound weight for most of us, a distance of about one foot this way with this musculoskeletal lever that I'm drawing for you requires a muscle force somewhere around 450 pounds. I have to pull with 450 pounds of force on this ulna to move 20 pounds one foot. Wow! That's quite a difference, isn't it? I know that the muscle force must be greater because it's closer to the fulcrum, isn't it? Now, I'd like you to think about this for a minute. Is this a good deal? A good investment? Just using, you know, round numbers here. So if my muscle force is 450 pounds and what do I get out of it? I can move 20 pounds. So I have to invest 450 pounds of force to move 20. Does that sound like a good deal? If you think so, how about this? If you give me 450 bucks you invest that with the 223 Bank of Duane. Let me hold that for like a week for you. And then after a week, I give you 20 bucks back and we call it done. Everything's fine. You walk away happy, I walk away happy. How about that? You give me 450 bucks, I give you 20. Done. Is that a good deal? But not for you, is it? That's a terrible deal for you. To invest 450 pounds of force and only get 20 out of it? That seems like a bad deal. Biomechanically, I'd like you to redesign this elbow so it's a little better deal. How about that? How could I reconstruct this elbow so that it's a little bit better deal for me. Well, okay. First, 
what would I need to do with this weight? I'd need to move that a little closer to the fulcrum, wouldn't I? So let's take the weight and move it closer to the fulcrum. Maybe the fulcrum's right here. And then let's take the muscle and move it farther away from the fulcrum. Maybe something like this. And now let's draw in the bones. So here's my olecranon process of my ulna. There's my forearm. Here's my humerus. Right, humerus. Ulna. So now my muscle force way out here, force of the muscle, which is right there, everybody, only where it inserts. And my weight force, which is where the weight is, force of the weight. Now the weight is much closer to the fulcrum. So if I create that same 450 pounds of force here, since this is closer, how much weight could I move? Well, a lot more than 450. Let's just be conservative here and say maybe now I could generate, hmm, let's say, six, seven hundred pounds of force here. Let's say seven hundred pounds of force. I could lift a seven hundred pound weight with this forearm with my tricep being exactly the same size, creating the same 450 pounds of force. That's a much better deal, isn't it? Now I get more out than I put in. How would you like this deal? Which I am not offering you, so don't show up at my office with money. You give me 450 bucks today, and then Friday I'll give you back 700 and we call it done. Well, you'd of course take that deal, or you would assume it's a con, wouldn't you? Most of you probably think that's some sort of con job that I'm trying to steal your money because that's way, way too good a deal. Unfortunately, this isn't your elbow, is it? This new one. This is not your elbow. This one is not the one you have. This is the one you have, the crappy one. This is somebody's, just not yours. Watch this. If I erase this, and instead of a hand, I made this a claw with some real nails in it. This is the elbow of a badger, an aardvark, an anteater, a much better musculoskeletal lever. Think of these animals. I'll pick on the North American badger just because we ha actually have some of them around here. The North American badger, Taxidae taxis, with real nails, not these terrible things we have. They can actually dig a hole in the dirt of the desert floor here with their keratinized nails. Can you do that? Even if I gave you good, good, powerful nails, you have trouble doing that. But their elbows allow them to do that. They can create huge amounts of force. If that new elbow was mine, it's hard for you to imagine the amount of force I could create. Ima imagine punching somebody in the head. If I had that mechanical advantage elbow where I could generate the 700 pounds of force, if I hit you once in the head, I would crush your skull. Easily. 
This is the kind of force we're talking about. We can't do that with our elbow because we give away all our force, don't we? Hmm, we're going to have to come back to that idea. Hopefully I will be able to clarify it in a little bit as we move forward. This lever that we've drawn right here is called a class 1 musculoskeletal lever. A class 1. This is a musculoskeletal lever where the fulcrum is in the middle between the two forces. The fulcrum, the big dot, is in the middle. This class 1 lever can be weak, like the one we have, or it could be strong, like the one the badger has. Depends on where the forces are located. So class 1 just means the fulcrum is in the middle. And if I have a class 1 lever, what does that tell you I better at least have? Well, a class 2. I don't think I'm letting a big lecture secret out of the bag here. We actually have three classes of lever because we have three different components of a musculoskeletal lever. So there are three classes of lever, each one defined by who's in the middle. In a class 2, let's write our notes first, the weight, the force of the weight is in the middle. In a class 3, the muscle or force of the muscle is in the middle. Three classes of musculoskeletal lever. Let me draw out a class 2 for you. A class 2 musculoskeletal lever. This one, I don't know how good it's going to be. I'll do my best, everyone. So these are phalanx bones of your toes. metatarsals, all those tarsals, calcaneus, talus, remember that? And then here's that tibia right there sitting on top. There's tibia. The muscle we have is the gastrocnemius or the calf muscle, which comes down and attaches by a tendon to the calcaneus. This is called the calcaneal tendon. And the fulcrum in this lever system is right here, the ball of your foot. force of the muscle right here at the insertion only. Remember that. And where's the weight? Well, let me give you a little demonstration here. Here's this musculoskeletal lever in action. Everybody watch very closely. Just go up on my tiptoes. Like that. What weight am I moving when I do that exercise? What weight is being moved? Me, my body weight. So if we jump back to our picture, the weight is my body weight right 
down this tibia, which is the weight-bearing bone of my leg or lower leg. So here's where the weight is. The force of the weight, right here. So use your imagination a little bit. Let's pick a different, how about uh, orange. See where the force of the muscle is. See where the weight is. And see where the fulcrum is. The weight is in the middle of these three things. The weight is closer to the fulcrum. In a class two lever, class two, the force of the weight is closest to the fulcrum. The force of the weight is always greatest or bigger. A class two lever is a very strong lever. We say that it works at a mechanical advantage. I can produce a great amount of force without a lot of effort. If you don't believe me or you need more illustration, let's go back to my class two lever. How much weight am I moving? Well, let's round up and say 200 pounds. I'm lifting 200 pounds off the ground over and over again right here. And is it very hard for me to do this? No, people. Watch this. Watch this. I'll do it with one foot. Ooh. Not that impressive, I know, but think about it. I'm lifting 200 pounds off the ground over and over again with just one calf muscle. Force-wise, that is pretty impressive, isn't it? Force-wise, that's a lot. That's a mechanical advantage. I can use a small amount of force for my calf muscle and move a large weight. Class two levers are always strong because the muscle force is farthest, the weight is closest to the fulcrum, so the weight is the greatest force. This might take a little rewinding and thinking about, but I think you can handle it. Go over it a few times. Class twos are always strong levers. They always work at a mechanical advantage. In a class three lever, the muscle force is in the middle. Let me draw you one of those. Let me draw you a class three lever. And I always like to just use the elbow again. Just a different orientation. So here's that humerus right here. Here's the ulna. Again, I can't draw a hand, so this person's holding the weight. But now, instead of the triceps brachii, I'm talking about the biceps brachii. attached right here. The fulcrum, just so it's easy to understand, is still right in the synovial joint here. The force of the weight, out here where the weight's located. And the muscle force, again, I can't stress this enough, is only right here where the muscle inserts. 
So do you see that the muscle force is much closer to the fulcrum than the weight force is? So the muscle force is the greatest force, always, in a class 3. A class 2 is always strong. A class 3, always weak. Or we say it works at a mechanical disadvantage. I put in a lot of force and get almost none out. You know, doing people a bicep curl trying to move the weight that way. To summarize, a class one musculoskeletal lever. Who's in the middle? Fulcrum's in the middle. A class one can be strong like the badger, can be weak like us. Either one, it depends on where everything's located. Class two, where the weight's in the middle, the force of the weight's in the middle always strong. Or technically speaking, we always say always works at a mechanical advantage. These are the kind of levers we like, class two levers, or ones that work at a mechanical advantage. Class three lever where the force of the muscle is in the middle, always weak. Or they always work at a mechanical disadvantage. They're a bad deal. So if you had to pick which class lever would you like to have the most of? Well, of course you'd pick number two. You'd love to have a lot of those. So, these are the most rare in the human body. Very rare, class twos. Only a few class ones The most common class we have is, of course, class three, the weak ones. So common, everybody, that if you see a test question and you're asked to classify a lever and you can't tell who's in the middle, if you're forced to guess, guess class three. Because we got more class threes than we have anything else. For sure. It's not even close. Now, what did I just tell you? I want you to think about that for a second. I told you you're weak. You know why? Because you're weak. We have so many class threes that we're not very, so your hair's not good, your nails are worse, your skin, which is good, is mostly dead when I look at you. Once puberty's over, the rest of our lives, all we're doing is shrinking and drying out. And now you're weak. Certainly you're weak. Why do we have all these class threes if they don't work at a mechanical advantage, if they're not strong levers for us? There is a reason. I can explain it by going back to look at our strong class one. Remember the badger arm up here? That's a great arm, but look how short that forearm would be. Look at how short this forearm would be. Whoops, right here for this badger. 
Yes, I could crush your skull with one punch, but I would have to be right next to you when I hit you because my forearms would be so small. Yeah, you know, like little T-Rex arms. Why then do we have all these class threes where the weight can be so far away from the fulcrum? They allow me to have these big swings of my limbs. When we talk about motions, flexion, extension, circumduction, remember those? So by losing or giving up the strength, what do I gain? Big range of motion. And since I can swing my limbs in these big arcs, I can cover more ground more quickly. So I can move faster. So we give up, we lose on the force compared to the badger, but we can run away a lot faster than the badger can. And yes, I just insinuated that not only are we all weak, we're also cowards. Running away is what we gain the ability to do by losing all this muscle force. So we lose muscle force, but we gain range of motion and speed of movement by giving up all this force. I know this is some strange stuff if it's the first time you've ever heard it. So rewind me, play it over again. Class ones, fulcrum in the middle. Can be weak or strong, most of ours are weak. Class two, Weight's in the middle, always strong, always a mechanical advantage. Class three, force of the muscles in the middle, always weak, always a mechanical disadvantage.